And so as we continue to study through the commandments, we come to the fourth commandment. Before we consider that, let's review the first three commandments. So what is the first commandment? Anyway, the word of God is going no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me or beside me. And, and how did we say that we could summarize what's required of us in that commandment? In short, I will willingly suffer the loss of anything rather than displease my God in any way or go against his will or word in any way. Right, so there's, we will not value, trust, or love anything alongside or in competition with God. And then the second commandment is... You I shall agree with anything. Shall not make yourself a graven image of anything um, on the earth or in the sky above or the seas below. Shall not bow down to them or worship them. Which means there's really two major application points from us, for us from that. Um, the first being that we ought not to make any images of God. Because none of the images we can create can accurately represent God's character or nature. And then the second is that we are to worship God in only the ways that He has commanded us to worship Him. Not in any other way. The third commandment is nope, that's the fourth. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Which means for us that we should never use God's name with anything but reverence and solemnity and that we should live our lives such that our yes is yes and our no is no. And we ought never to swear upon any other creature or created thing. And the fourth commandment which we come to today it's Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11 remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy six days you shall labor and do all your work but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God on it you shall not do any work you or your son or your daughter your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. So then what does it mean to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy? Now this is probably of the Ten Commandments, the one that has had the most debate in the history of the church about um, well, several different debates on what exactly does it require how is it to be kept and even just is it still binding upon Christians today and there's great dispute about all of that but we know the, the essence of keeping the Sabbath is what the Lord himself said in the next verse. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. 
but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. And there's a list, you know, you're not supposed to do any work. You're not supposed to make anybody else in your household do any work for you. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, uh, New England Puritan, 1700s, um, made an observation. It's apparently very commonplace. Uh, not that there weren't very many Jews among the, the pilgrims, the colonists, but there were some. And they would habitually hire someone, one of their neighbors, to stoke the fire for them on Saturdays because they weren't allowed to do it. They still wanted the fire going. Um, that would seem to me to be a violation of the fourth commandment still because it, it says, you know, not only are you not supposed to do any work, but you know, your entire household, your male and female servants, or even the sojourner who's within your gates isn't supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. So, the, the, the question has always been, how do we keep the Sabbath? How, what does it mean to not do any work? Because work is a very nebulous concept. Right? If, if we're talking about physics, work is any application of force over distance. And it, and it, you're doing work when you walk. You're doing work when you stand up. Um, so what is what is work? And the Pharisees, uh, this Jewish tradition, tried to very carefully define what work is and what work isn't. So you could walk this far without it being work, and if you took one step further, now you're working. Now you're violating the Sabbath. You could lift something that weighs so much, but if you add one more you know, stick or stone to the bundle, then, well, now it weighs too much, and now you're doing work. Uh, you, you might recall Gospel of Mark, Jesus and his disciples get into trouble on the Sabbath because they are, does anyone remember? Making grain. Well, so... Yes, they're walking through a grain field. The disciples are hungry. They reach out and they take some of the grain, which is allowed in the Jewish law. Um, you're allowed to take anything from the edges of, of the field. Uh, you can't you know, bring a basket and harvest it, but you can take it to eat it yourself. The problem is, yeah, to eat the grain, right? they had to crack the shells, which the Pharisees said, well, that's work. They're doing work on the Sabbath. Uh, on another occasion, Jesus is in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And they bring him a man with a withered hand to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath. Because they considered that to be a Sabbath violation. Right, so, so they had this very exact set of rules of, well, this is work, this is not work, you can go this far, you can lift this much, um, you can water your animals on the Sabbath. But, right, how did Jesus respond to the Pharisees? In either of those cases, he said really the same thing, essentially. So, oh, the Lord is, he's the Lord yeah. said. So, when he was walking through the grain fields, he says that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And he refers back to the time when David was given the holy bread from the tabernacle when he was fleeing from Saul. And then, uh, when he was in the synagogue, he looks around to the Pharisees and he asks, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? And they refuse to answer him. And so he commands me to stretch out your hand, and he stretches it out, and it's, it's healed. And then the Pharisees immediately go and take counsel with the Herodians, against Jesus, how to destroy him. So I guess they didn't consider that to be a Sabbath violation. But because of their anger at Jesus saving life on the Sabbath, they go out to 
seek to kill him on the Sabbath. I guess they figured since they weren't going to actually kill him on the Sabbath, it would be okay. They would just plot to do it. So, yeah, the Jews tried to very, or at least the Pharisees, tried to very strictly bind, define what work was on the Sabbath. This is work, this is not work. You, you can go this far and not one step further. Jesus seemed to disagree with the Pharisees on that. He did not ever say that, well, the Sabbath no longer applies. He didn't say it's been done away with. But he did say the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's not meant to be a burden upon mankind, but a blessing to them. I mean, we're, we're all happy historically right, that we live in a point where we have a five-day work week, right? Or, or even a six-day work week is the next thing, right? And now there are people talking about how we should have a four-day work week, right? We don't want to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, nobody wants to do that. And yet, so often we feel so so constrained when, when God says that we should only work six days and keep the seven. Um, but we don't want to work more anyway. We just want to have the freedom to do whatever we want on that day. So, The Orthodox Catechism uh, focuses on what we should do on the Sabbath. Um, the Westminster Shorter Catechism also talks about what we should not do on the Sabbath. And I, I think they're both very helpful. And so we'll, we'll refer to both as we try to apply this in our own lives. So the Orthodox Catechism, question 117, what is God's will for you in the fourth commandment? It says, first, that the gospel ministry and education for it be maintained, and that especially on the festive day of rest, I regularly attend the assembly of God's people to learn what God's word teaches, to participate in the sacraments, to pray to God publicly, and to bring Christian offerings for the poor. So, so basically, how do we keep the Sabbath holy? by as, as regularly as we're able gathering with the saints to worship together on the Lord's day. And then second, that every day of my life I rest from my evil ways, let the Lord work in me through his spirit, and so begin already in this life the eternal Sabbath. And, and Hebrews talks about how there, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, and that's where... Um, Hebrews 4, 9 through 12, it's in the footnotes. There, there, there is an eternal Sabbath rest that we're looking for. It's, it's the true promised land. It's, it's in God's presence. And so we begin this eternal Sabbath even now in this life as we rest from our evil works. But there's, there's more, I think, than, than just that. And... Again, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, I think, helps us here. Uh, this is question 60 in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Asked, how is the Sabbath to be sanctified? How is the Sabbath to be kept holy? Answer, the Sabbath is to be sanctified by a holy resting all that day, even from such worldly employments and recreations as are lawful on other days and spending the whole time in the public and private exercises of God's worship, except so much as to be taken up in the works of necessity and mercy. So, so that's the, the Puritan understanding of, of the Sabbath. It, it differs slightly from the, the Continental Reformed view, um, the, the Swiss and German Calvinists, um, where they generally were more permissive of recreation on the Sabbath. Um, 
And there's the, the English Puritans forbid worldly recreation and employment uh, that's lawful on, on other days. Um, except so much as it's to be taken up by works of necessity and mercy. And, and I think they um, see, you can get this from, from different places, but I think this, these works of necessity and mercy we see in those two consecutive instances in the Gospel of Mark where um, right, the disciples are crushing the grains of head on, on the Sabbath because it's necessary for them to do that to eat. Um, and, and then we see the act of mercy in the healing of the man with the withered hand. Jesus allows both of these things. Where the problem comes in is, is then, so, well, okay, what's a work of necessity and mercy? Because it seems like if we're anxious to do it, we can make that cover almost anything. Um, but that's true of, of so much of God's commandments, where if we're looking for ways to break it and justify it to ourselves, we, we can very easily do so. Who is my neighbor? Right. Um, and the, the point here, I think, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be concerned about you know, well, how could this be misused by people who profess to be Christians and, and aren't? Our concern should be that well, how, do we, how do we faithfully apply this in our own lives? And, and I think we do that when our primary focus isn't on, well, this is what I can't do, but on this is, this is what my Sabbath is supposed to be devoted to. Um, again, Westminster says, spending the whole time in the public and private exercises of God's worship. Um, the Orthodox Catechism says that on festive days of rest, I regularly attend the assembly of God's people, so on. So, our, our, I think we best keep the Sabbath when we focus ourselves, especially that day, on worship both public and private. But then when, when there's something that seems like it needs to be done on that day, I mean, we, we should, okay, can this wait until tomorrow? And if the answer is obviously yes, then we say, okay, I'll wait until tomorrow. But if it seems like no, this really seems like it should be done today. Or especially if it's, well, someone's going to suffer if this isn't done today. Then we, we shouldn't feel guilty about taking care of those things on the set. Um, you know, if, if someone's air conditioner, we're, we're a soft people dependent upon air conditioning now. Um, somebody's air conditioner goes out and you've got a window-mounted unit at home, I don't think any of us have the skill set to fix the air conditioner. But, you know, like we shouldn't have said that, well, yeah, I've got one. I'll bring it over tomorrow. And we should say, yeah, I'll, I'll bring that over to you. It's obviously an act of mercy. Um, right, so we, we shouldn't... And so we, we also should and I've said this before, we, we shouldn't be nitpickers on how other people feel about works of necessity. You know, we, we shouldn't have said that, well, yeah, I know this guy was hungry, but he wouldn't have died if he'd waited until Monday to feed him. Right? We, we shouldn't, if, if they felt it was necessary, if they felt it was an act of mercy, then, then we should get, you know, leave them to their conscience on that. Um, And then uh, Westminster also, question 61, adds, what is forbidden in the fourth commandment? And the answer is, the fourth commandment forbiddeth the omission or careless performance of the duties required. So that's, fourth commandment forbids us to not 
uh, to, to carelessly neglect the gathering of the saints, neglect worship. If we're not keeping the Sabbath, if we just decide, well, I'm just going to stay in bed and sleep all that went, I mean, if you're not sick, exhausted or some such. Um, so it forbids the omission of careless performance of the duties required and the profaning of the day by idleness or doing that which is in itself sinful or by unnecessary thoughts, words, or works about our worldly employments or recreations. So one, one example of, of this, that it's, it's not actually listed in the, in the footnotes, but I think it's relevant. In the book of Nehemiah, as Jerusalem is being rebuilt, traders start coming to Jerusalem to buy and to sell. I mean, that's a great thing except that they're coming on the Sabbath. And so Nehemiah tells the traders, no, you can't come on the Sabbath. We're not going to buy and sell on the Sabbath. This is a day of worship. And so the traders said, okay, that's fine, I guess, whatever. Whatever you say, we can accommodate your religious beliefs. And so they just, okay, we'll just camp outside Jerusalem on the Sabbath. And then the next day, we'll just be right there to, to come in. Right? And Nehemiah says, no, you can't do that either. Um, he, he drives them off. Because even though they weren't actively buying and selling on the Sabbath, they, they were still there occupied with their worldly employment. Right? They, they were there just camping out, waiting to sell. Um, So we, we can, even if we're not actively working, it's still very possible for your, your Sabbath rest to be taken up with, okay, this is all the things I need to do tomorrow. Um, let me plan out my entire day and schedule, you know, get everything. So we should, we should not give unnecessary thought or work to these things. So, so again, all this, I think, is encapsulated by, by focusing this day as much as possible upon worship. Um, that's how we avoid the idleness. It's how we avoid doing what in and of itself is sinful. It's how we avoid uh, neglecting the duties required of us. It's how we avoid the unnecessary works and, and words and thoughts. Um, it's by keeping the day holy giving it over to worship. Um, and doing, doing only so much as is necessary or merciful. So, and, and, I mean, even works of mercy, I think, we see as an act of worship on that day. Um, so, so we do what's necessary. We feed our kids and feed ourselves and feed our animals. And, and whatever other miscellaneous things come up that need to be done that day. Uh, but as much as possible, we do things before, we do things after, we set aside the Sabbath for worship. Uh, and then... Um, Both, I thought both, the Westminster Shorter Catechism and the 1689 Confession that we read, that's, um, both make the point that from the creation of the world to the death of, to the resurrection of Christ, the Sabbath was on the seventh day of the week, um, and then from the resurrection of Christ until the end of the world, the Sabbath has been moved to the first day of the week, which is called the Lord's Day which is when we celebrate the Lord's resurrection from the dead. Um, we continue to do so to the end of the world. This is the Christian Sabbath. Um, so that, that is our understanding. It's, it's the historic uh, Protestant understanding of the Sabbath. Um, there are a lot of people who disagree with us. Um, I think personally, that, that the most effective way to reason with those 
people is to it, it is an obligation but just like all of God's laws it's an obligation for our good um, it's a, a Sabbath of rest and worship if we're thinking, do I have to do this? If we're already thinking about that. We get to do this. Um, what? What could be more wonderful than having this day? Well, we couldn't lay down these worldly employments, employments that we're going to be only too glad to lay down forever um, in, in the eternal state. And it's, it's the closest, closest day to eternity that we get to experience regularly here in this life. It, it, the Sabbath is, is a foretaste of eternal life. Not perfectly, but it is. And, and if, if, we're, if we're bored, with the Sabbath, then how are we going to cope with eternity? Because uh, John Eldridge is wrong when he talks about mountains and kayaking trips and all these other things that you're going to get to do in heaven. If you haven't read John Eldridge, you don't need to. Don't worry about it. He was kind of popular in college students 15 years ago. Um, so, um, that is the fourth commandment. We devote the day to public and private worship, and we abstain as much as possible from all works that are not works of necessity or mercy. Um, and I, I think we should work to grow in our enjoyment and appreciation of the Sabbath rest. So. Sing one more song together. Uh, song, I am bound for the promised land.